As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. Welcome to Home Group. This is Rick Renner, and tonight I'm here with Denise Renner, Maxime, and Joel Renner. Welcome, guys, to Home Group. Thank you, Rick, and Home Group, welcome. We're so glad that you're with us, and we just want you to take in everything that we're learning about the rest of the story. Well, actually, Christmas. I, and I want them to get the download oh. free. I know, free. D Denise, it's like a whole book. It's 124 pages in a study guide. Joel, that is amazing. That's a lot of pages for a study guide. We worked very hard on this, and we're wanting to give it to you. All you have to do is go to renter.org, and you can download it right now. You can use it to read, to teach, to share. It is amazing, and it comes with the whole series, which is 15 parts. You can get an audio or video, I highly recommend that you get it in some visual form because in the very beginning of every single program, I'm filming on location in Israel at where all of these amazing sites took place. It's worth the whole series just to see these locations. Well, and Rick, there's so much precious information that we're sh sharing that y sometimes you can forget it. But if you if you download that study guide, then you'll have it and, and you'll be able to refresh your memory and think about it because really powerful things. And right now we're also offering my book, Sparkling Gems, number two, Sparkling Gems, number one. I know you're thinking about what to get people for Christmas. I cannot imagine a a better gift than sparkling gems. Denise, I see these books all over the world in pastor's offices, in the homes of families. So many people read sparkling gems. And when you first see it, it looks a little intimidating because of its size, but you don't read the whole thing at once. It's a daily devotional. You just read a little piece every day and it's very easy to do. It's called sparkling gems because it's filled with gems from the New Testament. By the time you get finished with this, you're going to feel like you've been to Bible school on a daily basis. Isn't it amazing? Oh, I love sparkling gems. I love sparkling gems. You know what I do when I get those books in my hands? What do you do? I open up my birthday. Ah, a lot of people go straight for their birthday. A lot birthday. of people do that. Yes. A lot of people. Those are great books. Wonderful books. And they're filled with stories. Wonderful, relatable stories from your life, of course. And I think they're just wonderful and they're a lot of fun. Thank you, Joe. Maxine? I'm excited to be here. I, I never thought of it going to my birthday. Oh, I do it every time. I'll, I'll do it. I'm happy to be here. And as I said, I already, I already said it. When I was growing up, and my parents never talked to me about Christmas. Teachers at school never talked to me about Christmas. So I'm, I'm always hungry to hear and learn about Christmas. Maxime is from such a communist family that his grandmother taught. Well, let's see. How do I say it? Her job was to Indoctrate. brainwash people, brainwash people that God was not true. And when she died, Maxime found her Bible. It's actually an anti Bible. It's a Bible that was filled with all the re with all the commentary from communists about why the Bible cannot be true. That's where Maxime was raised in a very anti God family. Just didn't believe in it. And thought it was all nonsense. So the rest of the story about Christmas for you is really a revelation. Yes, sir. Maxine, did your grandmother die before you knew the Lord? I, I led her to the Lord. Wow. She got saved. I prayed about her. She, she prayed the prayer. Wow, that's she so died. amazing. And Maxine, her job was in the big factory. Yes, yeah, she was. If, somebody, if yeah. somebody was a little religious, then her job was to bring them in and tell them why it was wrong, right? Right. right. She, uh, Christians that were arrested would be brought to her, and she would tried to explain to them that there is no God. And her job was to visit huge factories where they would collect all the workers, like 300 people, 500 people, and she would stand behind the pulpit, or, or it was not a pulpit. And she would tell all the workers of many factories in Volgograd region or Stalingrad region that there is no God, that it was her job to brainwash people on such high level. God has a way of overcoming the works of the devil. Because look at her grandson. Look at her grandson. Praise You're God. preached and preached and preached and preached. Praise the Lord. And <laughs> after your grandmother did all that wrong, she ended up in heaven. Yes. That, I mean, the mercy of God is oh, amazing. Amen. But hey, if you need prayer, let us know how to pray for you. Just write us prayer at runner.org or you can call us 1-800-742-5593. We'll call you back but we would love to pray with you. But tonight, 
we're going to see why God chose Joseph. Last night we looked at Mary, but hey, Joseph is a big part of this story. And people really focus on Mary, but think about the assignment given to Joseph. He was the foster father of the Son of God. What kind of a man was him that God would trust this man with the biggest assignment ever given to any man in human history? Why did God choose Joseph? Was there a reason or was this just random choice? Did God just throw names into a bag, shake it up, reach in like a lottery and say, mm, I'll choose Joseph. No, no, no. God doesn't do anything like that. That's silly. That's nonsense. God is logical. God is very predictable in how he works. And tonight we're going to see reasons why God chose Joseph. And my friends, God wants to choose us. Mm -hmm. He's looking at us. God is observing us to see if we're ready for another assignment. Joel? The Bible says that God looks to and fro all over the earth for people he can trust. That's right. And when we go to the book of Job, God says, did you see my servant Job? Mm. I mean, God is looking for people he can trust with big things. Amen. And one of them, of course, was Joseph. Well, let's begin tonight with a myth about Joseph. Was Joseph a carpenter and was Joseph poor? The answer is he was not poor and he was not a carpenter. Now I can just hear somebody say, oh, heresy, the Bible says he was a carpenter. It's a bad translation. In Matthew 13, 55, it is translated that, jo that Jesus was the carpenter's son. That word carpenter is just a really bad translation. In Greek, it is the word tekton, it's where you get the term technology. And the word tecton, listen to this, does not describe a carpenter, has nothing to do with wood at all. You can't even connect it to wood or to a saw or to a hammer or to a nail. It's not connected to that at all. The word tecton describes a person that is highly advanced in whatever skill he possesses. It depicts one who makes, listen to this, exquisite furniture, very expensive, jewel-laden jewelry, mosaics that are fabulous, stonework, or even a building supervisor, a building supervisor. So when you translate this as the word carpenter, it misses the point completely. And because of paintings that were painted in the Middle Ages that show Joseph as a carpenter, that's really where this took root. Everybody has this idea that Joseph was a carpenter. Anybody who knows Greek knows that word carpenter, the Greek word tecton, has nothing to do with carpentry. Nothing. Now, I've told you that I'm writing a book called Christmas, The Rest of the Story, and I've hired an illustrator to illustrate the whole book, and he has illustrated Joseph in the surroundings where a tecton may have found himself. Are you guys ready for this? It's fabulous. Oh, I can hardly wait for you to have this book. But look at this. This shows Joseph, not as a poor man, but he was a well-to-do, very successful professional. Here he's standing with architectural maps in his hands, designs, instruments, a beautiful table because the word tecton could be somebody who described exquisite furniture. It's got jewelry on the table because a tecton could have made exquisite jewelry. It has a building project in the background because he could have been a building supervisor. And in fact, Joseph lived in Nazareth. Guess what? There was no work in Nazareth. If you've ever been to Nazareth, you know there's nothing in Nazareth. There's just nothing there, especially for a tecton. Where would a person like a tecton, a highly advanced professional, where would he work in Nazareth? Well, there's no work in Nazareth, but nearby, four miles away, was the city of Sephoris. And Sephoris was being constructed at that time, and the Herod who was building it was committed that it would become the banking center of the Middle East. He wanted it to be the ornament of Galilee, and that's what it became. And the building works taking place in Sephoris at that time were enormous. And if you go to Sephoris, you'll see that there's a theater, there's a central street, a gate. In fact, this entire illustration is built on the real 
architectural layout of the ancient city of Sephoris. And here is Joseph right in the middle of it, surrounded by things that he would have been involved in, including furniture, mosaics, stonework, building works, architectural plans, jewelry. All of these things were potential professions for Joseph. He was not a poor carpenter working in some little carpenter shop hidden in Nazareth. There was no work in Nazareth. He worked in Sephora. Joel? Thinking about modern day, you know, in Moscow, we have something called Moscow City where there are such tall, tall, tall striped scrapers. And when I hear you explain what a tech talk is and who a Joseph was, that professional, I think about Joseph was, in modern day's world, was probably the architect of these tall, tall, tall skyscrapers. He wasn't a metal worker or a rivet worker. He wasn't someone working with those drills. He was probably someone who managed building 100, 200 tall skyscrapers. In today's world. In today's world, if, if we could do that. But I think it's just amazing how we think that Joseph had a wooden table where he was doing wood chips, wood chips, and Jesus was playing under the table helping them get saws. Joel, that's based on a bad translation and paintings painted in the Middle Ages. People base their whole faith on paintings unless they base their faith on greeting cards. Because you get these greeting <laughs> cards with pictures of the nativity. Everybody thinks they know what the nativity looked like because of what's on a greeting card, but you're going to find out the greeting cards are all wrong. They're all wrong. They're pretty, but they're not right. But Joseph was working in Sephora. Now, Stay with me. Sephora's was magnificent, and most scholars believe this word tecton probably indicates he was a building supervisor. We well, have to remember that Mary lived in Sephora's with her parents. That's where she lived. Her father was the scroll scholar in one of the most luxurious synagogues in all of Israel, a center so ex important that when Jerusalem fell in the year 70, all the spiritual education moved to the city of Sephora. The Sanhedrin moved to the city of Sephora. And it was Mary's father who really had laid the groundwork for all that spiritual education and ongoing learning in the city of Sephora. And it is most likely that Mary's parents saw this young man and said, wow, he would be an amazing husband for our daughter. Committed to the Bible, attend synagogue, He's got a good future. He's a professional. He's making money. I mean, they must have saw Joseph and thought, wow, that would be ideal for our daughter. And of course, marriages were arranged at that time. But they laid their eyes on this Joseph. This was not some poor, unsophisticated failure. People who say, oh, God chose somebody poor and unsuccessful. That doesn't even agree with the way that God does things. I'm going to show you in the Bible. God does not choose failures to do something great. He looks for people that have proven themselves faithful. And then he gives them a bigger assignment. But let's go on. Now, Joseph was qualified to be entrusted with greater riches. Why? Well, in Luke 16, 11, Jesus said, okay, you guys ready? Here's the verse. God's predictable. Here it is. Jesus said, if therefore you've not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Which means God's not give you true riches unless he has seen that you've been faithful in lesser riches. And God entrusts great riches and great assignments to people whom he has been watching and whom he has found to be faithful in past assignments. That's why I say to you that God is very predictable and based on how God works and based on principles taught throughout the Bible, we know that Joseph had to have been a man that was faithful in his profession in how he handled money, how he handled responsibility, or God would have never chosen him for an upgraded assignment. Because you don't get the upgrade until God has seen you faithful at what you're already doing. And in the same way that God was watching Joseph, God's watching me. In fact, just this morning I was praying, asking God to expand our influence and help us take the teaching of the Bible to people all over the world. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, be faithful with what you're doing because what you're doing right now will either qualify you or disqualify you for the next phase. God is watching us all the time to see if we're ready for a bigger 
assignment. And I have to ask, what does God see when he looks at you? It's a very important question. But what do we know about Joseph? Well, we know that he was a very merciful man. How do we know that? Because Matthew 1, 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother, Mary was a spouse to Joseph. Before they came together, she was a child of the Holy Ghost. So they were in this one year engagement when they were training and preparing for marriage. They'd been legally engaged. And suddenly during this period when there's no sexual contact, Mary is found to be with child of the Holy Ghost before they've come together. There's been no sexual relationship whatsoever. And Mary shows up pregnant. Well, according to the law, Joseph could have broken it off legally. He could have embarrassed her. He could have humiliated her. He could have even required that she be stoned to death. But the Bible tells us in Matthew 1, 19, then Joseph, her husband, why does it say her husband? Because they were legally engaged. Being a just man, he was a good man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. In other words, he was such a merciful man, he did not want Mary to suffer humiliation and public embarrassment. He truly loved her and cared more about him than his own reputation. This shows what a merciful and kind man Joseph was, which means when God looked for a foster father for his son, he looked for someone that was not abusive, somebody that was not harsh, someone that would be kind, and would be merciful. That's the kind of father he wanted Jesus to have in this earthly realm. Joel? I think it's interesting that before Mary became pregnant, the angel t spoke to her. But to Joseph, it was like God gave him the last test. How would he respond to Mary's pregnancy? Because the angel only appeared to Joseph after he considered what he was going to do, and he fell asleep. And I think that's very interesting. God is testing us all the time. And we don't know when the last test will be before we get our promotion. But I think it's very important to know that we're being watched. God is watching us and we can be found faithful in whatever we do. But, but you know what else? The very fact that God chose Joseph means he had already seen Joseph in earlier situations be kind and merciful. He already knew this about Joseph. He knew that's how Joseph would respond. This was no random choice. This was nothing accidental. God already knew this about Joseph. But let's go on. <laughs> I yeah, want to Denise. say something because sure. it's so amazing about Joseph. I mean, Joel already pointed it out, but in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 1, then Joseph, this is his first encounter, supernatural encounter. Can you hold on to that? Because we're going to get to that in just a moment. I really want you to save that. I don't want to get this out of order. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Denise. Oh, no problem. Let's go to Matthew 1.20. And in Matthew 1.20, we see that Joseph was spiritually attuned and he was obedient to God. That's what you're going to talk about. But let's cover this first. Matthew 1, 20. While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, here's what I want you to hear. He was so spiritually attuned that even in a very difficult situation, he was able to hear the voice of God. Think about that. So many people who say, oh, I'm so confused. I just cannot hear the Lord. Joseph was so spiritually attuned, which means he was a spiritual man. Even in the middle of a difficult situation, he had an ear to hear what God had to say to him. So he was kind. He was merciful. God knew that. He had heard God speak to him at earlier times in his life. That's why God knew he would have an ear to hear right now. God knew all of this about him because of previous experiences. But wait, now we go to what Denise wanted to say in Matthew 1, 24 and 25. When Jesus woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, which means he wasn't just open-eared to hear the Lord, but he was quick to obey. Denise. I, in studying this, I was just thinking about Joseph one day, about how tuned, you said that word, Rick, but how tuned he was. It's like the Lord says this, and he goes, Whoosh. and then the Lord says, take your take your child and your wife and 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 go right now 
and he would be so obedient. I mean, quickly obedient. But Denise, he didn't become obedient in that moment. God had been watching him. God already knew he was kind. God already knew he was merciful. God already knew he had an ear to hear because he had been listening. God already knew he would obey. God knows all of those things. That's what qualifies us. And Rick, we are practicing for a bigger assignment every day. Every day. Every day we're every day. practicing for a more difficult assignment. But let's go on. You guys got your Bibles? Go to Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. After Jesus' birth... The Bible says the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. There he is again, there God is. speaking to him. He is so sensitive. He can hear God speak to him again and again saying, arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. So God says, I'm going to speak to you again. And he knows that Joseph will have an ear to hear for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, just like Denise just said, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. He didn't even wait till the next morning. That night. He heard and he went. Now, part of the story here is it sounds like they just got up and just, you know, within five minutes they were in Egypt. It was about a 14 day trip into Egypt. So that night they began the trip. They began the walk of obedience to get over into Egypt. But. This reveals that Joseph had great trust in God. Why? Because, first of all, he had been working very hard in Sephoris. He made a reputation. He was a professional. He had made a career for himself. He was earning money. And for him to obey the Lord, he had to be willing to walk away from it all. And God knew that he would do that. God knew that. Because God had seen him be obedient in earlier things. Not only that, in Egypt, he had no work permit. And you had to have a work permit to work in Egypt. It was a land that they did not know. It was drastically different than living in Nazareth and Sephora's. And to move your family from where you're secure into a brand new environment, which we've done. We know something about that. It requires a high level of trust and a high level of of obedience, but God knew Joseph would do it because he'd already been watching Joseph and Joseph had obeyed quickly in earlier moments in his life. That is amazing. What does your level of obedience reveal about you? God's watching. God already knows, but he's watching. And Joseph was a spiritual leader for his family. How do we know that? Because in Luke, Chapter 2, verses 41 and 42, the Bible tells us, listen to this. Now, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. But notice, dear friends, it says Joseph took his family every year to celebrate the Passover. Well, to go from Nazareth to Jerusalem was quite a trek. That was a big thing. And he took his family every year. And guess what? They didn't just go once a year, but Jews were required to go to Jerusalem multiple times every year. It was a very big deal, a big outlay of money, a big outlay of time. And Joseph didn't say, I'm going to stay home and send my kids to church. He set the example. He was a spiritual man. He was the spiritual leader of his family. He led them spiritually and he led them by example, without question. God's selection of Joseph to be Jesus' foster father was not an accident. It was not the result of random choice. He had watched Joseph for a long, long time. He knew all these things about Joseph and his character. God had seen that Joseph was trustworthy with his talents, his business, and his money with mammon. He had watched Joseph be merciful earlier in life instead of being judgmental. Hmm. He knew Joseph would have an ear to hear him. He knew that Joseph would be quick to obey. He knew that Joseph would be the spiritual leader of his family. Joseph had a track record with God. And just like God had his eyes on Joseph, God has his eyes on me. He's got his eyes on Denise, on Maxime, on Joel. He's got his eyes on you. 
to see if we're ready for an upgrade in our assignment. And let me tell you something, friends. This testing never stops. For example, one of these days we're going to all go to heaven. Well, what do you think we're going to do in heaven? Just sit around and play harps and eat and have fun? No, 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 no. There's going to be massive assignments in heaven. And guess what? Life is qualification for what we're going to do in eternity. It doesn't end. We're qualifying to the ends of our life. God is watching us. He's examining our works. This is all a period of qualification for what we're going to be doing in eternity. So it doesn't end here. We're just qualifying for the next phase. God's got his eyes on us, just like God had his eyes on Mary, and God had his eyes on Joseph. And Joseph passed the test, and he got the big upgrade to become the foster father of Jesus. What? What an upgrade. What do you think, Joel? Oh, I think it's just marvelous. And I know this was yesterday, but we talked about Mary's parents. And I'm thinking about how Mary's father was the head of the synagogue scrolls. He's so studious. He taught Mary so many things. And when the Son of God came to earth, he, he found himself in the scriptures. And I'm sure that Jesus' grandfather probably taught him the scriptures. Oh, that is so wonderful. And helped Jesus find himself because Jesus' birth was miraculous. And I'm absolutely certain that Mary's father, Jesus' grandfather, knew that what happened is no accident. And because he knew the scriptures. Jesus' grandfather knew the scriptures. He knew it, all of them. He knew the prophecies. He knew so much. And what happened to Mary, when, when she became pregnant with Jesus, I'm sure that Mary's father realized what, what was happening. I think he did. From, from all the prophecies and all the studies that he had done, and he was probably just elated. So he, I, his grandson the scripture. So I like that so much because Mary and Joseph lived with Jesus in Nazareth, but Sephoris was just four miles away. And Jesus was influenced by his grandparents. He would have gone to Sephoris very often to see his grandparents. Denise, we're grandparents. If you're a grandparent, it means Jesus' grandparents had an opportunity, like Joel says, to influence him. So do we. We can influence our grandkids that God's chosen them to do something. We're out of time. Hey, sleep well. Remember, if you need prayer, write to us, prayer at renner.org, or call us 1-800-742-5593. Be sure to order the whole series and get your free download, Christmas, the rest of the story, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Bye-bye. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.